Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. Gonna do my wrap up video real quick for the Southwest Audio Fest. Amazing weekend in Dallas. I have to do it pretty quick because I'm flying out tomorrow to go to New York. Gonna be featuring a system in Manhattan. That's all I'm gonna tell you at this point. And then I go to Montreal. It's for a Montreal audio show next weekend. Small show, obviously. But I had so much fun in Toronto. The organizers asked me if I'd come to the Montreal show. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. It brings up a good point, though. Um, a lot of these shows, like Tampa and Montreal and uh, Toronto, very supportive of the press. And that's what a lot of these vendors need. Because the traffic itself, no matter if it's a big show or small show, only lasts so long. And people can only get so much of a flavor. So it's very important for coverage like mine, where I go into every room, uh, give every, at least as many as I can, coverage that lasts forever, uh, it makes it much more worthwhile for these vendors to go to the shows. So these shows that support the press and help the press get there and all that stuff definitely are ones I like to give a shout out to and definitely like to support. And the Montreal, Toronto, Tampa, thumbs up on that. Uh, I will give props as well to the Southwest Audio Fest. I drove up there, uh, paid my own way, everything like that. But um, they took a risk going to this venue, Hilton Anatoly. And it was, I think it paid off great. Everybody had a great time. A true high-end venue, much like I said in my preview show, much like the Gaylord was in uh, Denver for the Rocky Mountain Auto Fest, the last one actually. And I think they're coming back next year and have added two floors already. So I think this show is going to grow lots of fun and it does give you that different flavor. So hopefully that um, came through in the videos and my coverage. But if not, now you got the feedback on that. All right. What else I got to before we get started? You can always jump ahead in chapters. I'll probably break it into chapters or different things. And I don't want to regurgitate too much that I did in my daily wrap ups and my other friends. As you know, I like to showcase more than just my opinion because we all hear differently. As you know with the Bach, when you measure in ear, same room, same gear, same everything, we all have slightly different measurements. So giving you as many perspectives as possible is very important. But <laughs> inevitably, you know, there are some consistencies when you're a seasoned audiophile that you look for. And my friends, similar to me, have some of the same favorites. So I'm not going to harp too much on those. But let me get to some of the... Uh, best rooms and stuff. But first of all, I <laughs> wanted to showcase, yes, I'm wearing crazy outfits. You didn't see this hat because this is a hat I travel with to shows that I can't uh, bring heavy hats to. But if you didn't see my cool hats, get real quick. This was my custom hat I wore. Totally custom. And with a guy I collaborated with on Melrose Avenue, a boutique. And if I ever relaunch my clothing line, which I did have back in the 2000s, early 2000s, I think I'm just going to do cowboy hats with horns. That's going to be my signature. Badass. Whether it's horns for connotate a bull, devilish, whatever, I think it's cool. Uh, and actually, I my daughter joined me for the show, and I had a hat made for her. A little smaller, but this is true horns. <laughs> and uh, there's even a ring that comes on here. And so she was wearing this briefly. It's kind of heavy. So, oh, and if you didn't see my boots, sturgeon leather boots, I wore those one night. There they are. Sturgeon leather, very rare, very strong leather. Oh, also, I, I had them not even throw away the fins that are part of the uh, leather. Uh, they use the fins here. So almost like flying boots. Anyway, props to uh, Republic Boots on that. So enough with the crazy outfits, although like it ties into one of my favorite parts of the show. I like to get this out the way. The best parts of these shows, not the gear anymore or what you hear sound wise. I've gone to enough shows. I have a level of performance here that's going to be better than what you can get in these rooms, uh, no matter what gear it is. But it's so much fun to interact with my friends and new friends, meet new friends. And like you've seen, if you don't know... The posse that we had at the show, some of them are just through the, this YouTube channel I met. Pete the Greek, met through through him, through that Bob and his wife Darla. Uh, John, who you saw in that final video with their chorus, and he's bought like four box. These are all people I met strictly through the channel. So never feel uh, bashful. Come up, say hi. Uh, if you want to join the posse, we have a lot of fun. 
So that was really great. Also great seeing a lot of the vendors that were also at the Lone Star Audio Fest that I was one of the only people to cover last year in Dallas. Very small show. So they're going to make some of my list because I want to talk about ones that we didn't talk about too much in those wrap ups. So first thing I want to get out the way, and it goes back to my macro point of why you can't judge things strictly on sound quality. There were two rooms that, quite frankly, sound wise, I wouldn't have put them anywhere near the top. And in fact, uh, with the sound labs, because I had hyped it up so much and thought it was going to be so great, I would even put it in the disappointing category uh, in terms of what I heard empirically on sound. Uh, and there's even one video, I didn't even upload it. Uh, it just wasn't representative, I think, of the gear. And you say, well, why don't you do that? It's hiding something. Well, here I'm telling you it's disappointing, but I'm giving you context. Whereas a video with just YouTube clips, people can make judgments and never hear my commentary, uh, give you a much more perspective into why and why you don't always judge what you go into these rooms at by what you just hear. And like I said, that room was way too small. Uh, this was a new gentleman doing, and it re didn't even really truly represent Sanders, but he was just an avid fan of sound lamps, came all the way from Japan, had to set this up in the rooms that they were given, very small. Uh, he tried to keep the noise floor down, and so it was very uh, hot in there by, because he wasn't running the air condition. So there's always a lot of trade-offs. And for that speaker, uh, when I had the initial video, I said it was very impressive because we were talking about the design and what the potential is, line source, all one driver, how they do that curve, but keeping the driver flat, so the same tension when it exerts and enter, uh, the both ways, the same tension on the driver. So lots to be impressed by with the technology and the type of speaker it is. Just wasn't in a, an environment uh, combined. Uh, and again, it's another thing about synergy of gear. That burning amp, <laughs> push-pull, is one of the best in the world. In fact, Robert Harley reviewed that model uh, and said it's one of the best in the world, period. But for playing with sound labs at loud volumes, you know, there's always going to be synergy. It's like putting a Ferrari on a dirt road. You want to have synergy in the room and the gear to get high performance. So what I heard in there was definitely not among my best in the room, but the sound lab speaker technology and that burning amp are empirically on their own can be easily some people's favorite speakers if they have a certain taste in music, certain type of room, certain type of synergy with their gear. And then another example exactly like this in, a, in another way was the Scansonic and Margulis room. I love those Scansonic speakers in terms of their pedigree for the price. Uh, it's got the same DNA as Rido and Borison, and the price of that speaker was only 4500 bucks. And the black and white version looked phenomenal. <laughs> I think they looked as good, if not better, than $100,000 bookshelf Borisons. And it's only 4500 similar DNA. Um, may not be exactly full ring. You may have to add a sub or whatever. But here's the point. In that little cubby hole where they were set up, and they played Liberty, a song I'm very familiar with, I wasn't quite happy with what I was hearing, but as you go to these shows countless times, you know what it is is the problem. It's in a cubby hole. It's getting that coloration um, and so many things about it were easily fixable if you just put it in the right room. And the Margulis gear, I've heard it a thousand times. I mean, it's impeccable gear. That would be one of my recommendations, even though empirically what I heard at the demo and what was on uh, tape may not be the best, but I could guarantee you I'd take those Scansonic Sonic, uh, Sonic speakers at 4500 that Margulis integrated. I put it in a purpose dedicated room like this at a sub. I could blow people away with that. You got to be able to sniff that potential. And again, on aesthetics, phenomenal. I mean, the uh, Scansonic, I, I really like that model. Looked great in black and white. Watch that video. At the very end, you'll see the, the black and white, I think. Um, but I got a notes here, so I make sure I ca catch everything. And actually, let's go ahead and jump ahead to looks, since I just talked about looks. On metrics of looks alone, <laughs> I got to give some props to, number one, Estelon. The Forzes were there. Beautiful. Unbelievable finish. Just impeccable. And whatever color they bring, I'm just blown away by it. I don't know what I would choose myself. Uh, the Estelons are just beautiful. Now, they're high performance as well. But here's another example of a macro point I want to talk about, especially with my coverage. 
you'll probably notice I don't get all that worked up by what model number, what name it is on the chassis. Is it the Haley YG or the, the Carmel or the Sonya or Boulder 21, you know, Mark II, Mark I, I don't get too hung up on that. Once you go to enough shows as I have, you tend to just look past that. You kind of become like Neo in the Matrix. You're looking at Okay, is it MTM, the driver configuration, uh, is it a line source, point source, how is it set up? You're looking at other things as a priority than whatever model name they decide to call it or aesthetics of the chassis. Now, with speakers, it's very important to have impeccable aesthetics because that's it's a piece of furniture in your house. It's a very eye-catching piece. Uh, but in, in any case, the model numbers aren't that important, but in the case... And a lot of times, there's not a big difference as you go up the model line. It's stuff internally that you can t tell, that you can't really tell, or aesthetics on the chassis that are very minimal, or, or it's just bigger, you know, more power in an amp, bigger heat sinks and whatnot. Well, with Estelon, there is one exception. If you can afford the Forzas, and they do sound great, but if you can afford for the Forzas, I would just wait and get the Estelon Extremes Mark II. That is a huge leap, in my opinion, uh, for the extra money. I would definitely go for the Extreme Mark II because it launches base higher. Uh, and then you have that movable tweeter for time alignment and uh, taste and listening distances. These are the things I look at more than it just saying Extreme Mark II versus Forza's. The difference in how it's launching base uh, floor uh, instead of launching bass strictly from the floor, which sometimes can bring down the sound stage um, when you have bass material, uh, this Extreme Mark II is definitely what I would recommend, even over the Forzas. But regardless of what Estelon you buy, you've got one of the best looking speakers in the world. Impeccable. On looks again, I got to give a shout out to the Angel City Audio Finish in that they weren't playing loud enough for me to really evaluate the material and the sound. It was on the last day. I didn't have a lot of time in there, but the finish was extremely good. Definitely from a distance. I thought it was even just a black speaker. Uh, and then I got up close with the light on it. Exceptional. Uh, and not that expensive for that quality of finish. Another one that always blows me away with aesthetics is uh, Infigo with their amplifiers and their chassis design. They're not ones creating these monstrous chassis with, ex you know, excessive heat sinks, just people that, you know, are into the bigger is better motto. They are doing it purpose built where form follows function, but they are creating a very harmonious, at least to my eyes, aesthetic that is really cool. It's not gauges. They let you see under the hood, or you can cover it with a really thick plate of aluminum. And then the sound quality always does extremely well uh, with the Infigo rooms, which they were, I'm, I'm going to get to them in a second on sound quality. Um, but going to performance now, I want to give a shout out to one room that probably, I can't say there was any room that made me want to go back or anything like that, uh, but one room that definitely the delta of when I went in and when I left, having the biggest delta of surprise and impressiveness, was that first YG room I went into where they had it in the cubby hole, And I think they put some curtain treatment, did a really good job, smart job of putting those in there the right way and getting extremely good performance. I think they were the Vantage, but it wouldn't have mattered. They set it up properly, whether it was the Haley's, the Vantage, whatever. Those are often... Um, not my favorite YGs. Uh, I've been pretty vocal that the YGs 2.2, the big ones I featured in a home here in Houston, that's one of the best rooms I've ever been in when I've gone out with 3MA and rooms that they've set up. The one here in Houston with the YGs, you can go look at my videos in the past. Uh, that's probably my favorite of all the room. And it's got the big YGs. The smaller YGs have always been a little bit low frequency compromised for me and a little tonal balance not as great but you can add a sub easy and these were performing extremely well and sometimes when you're low frequency compromised with a speaker it tends to be bright uh, because in, in essence a lot of these full range speakers the bass is covering up for flaws in the uh, tonal balance up high it's kind of masking how they're not as coherent or bright but in this case when you don't have all the way to 20 hertz uh, and you still have a speaker that's not bright and very coherent 
I was very impressed with YG, especially that room, but all of them did well. And it's good to see them at a lot of, well, I don't know. They haven't been at many shows and then they were in every room here. Don't know what happened, why that was, but impressive. Um, let's see. Let's go to budget stuff because it also has to tie into aesthetics. You don't have to sacrifice looks anymore if you're on a budget. And this uh, show had some really cool budget stuff. Number one, always the king of budget and value and aesthetics, the, uh, the Triple Crown is Gashelli. I mean, they just knock it out the park. And you got to hear them with high-end per-listen speakers in this uh, time. So whether you want to put them with expensive speakers that have metrics that are beyond reproach and could be, you know, reference speakers for a lot of people, you got to hear that here. You've also seen in the past they paired with source points and other more economical options. You don't have to sacrifice buying Gashelli. And it was cool that they were also pairing with cables that you don't have to feel sacrificed either. The blue jeans cables that I represent were there used in the Gashelli room. And let me tell you, I brought my daughter and her boyfriend. They probably enjoyed, of all the rooms they went into, uh, the Gashelli room the best. It was cool, fun, but the headphones, that's what younger people are into. And you should be too. I mean, if you want to take the room out of the equation, no, headphones aren't perfect. You're not going to get that acoustic wave. Bass is not launched, you know, as good as it is with these kind of speakers. But in terms of hearing what's truly on the recording and certain metrics, headphones are what you should have as a counterbalance to your main system to see, are you getting reference performance in certain metrics here? Headphones don't replace it. And if you can afford it, try to get the uh, stacks uh, X9000, those are phenomenal, closest I've heard to being perfect, but still they're going to be compromised in bass, but that gives me a true representation when I listen to my recordings of when I've, I've been there, so I know, and then I play them back on my stacks, that tells me how realistic it is. You should get a headphone rig, and Gashelli makes amplifiers that are really budget, that compare with almost any headphones, except they haven't come out yet with um, electrostatic amps that I, that I know of. But any other kind of headphones you have, you shouldn't look past Caselli on the headphone amp side, with DAX too, uh, and beautiful chassis work. Also on the budget end, uh, Edifier had an all-in-one show special, DAC, amp, speaker, very nice looking. And uh, I think it was Pete or Dave, one of those two, spent more time in there testing it uh, and testing it at high volumes and was very impressed for the money. Definitely one to look at. So props to them. Another budget uh, option, and I'm Mr. DSP. I saw this Planet Venus. Unfortunately, I did a video the first day in there and it got blocked. So here's the thing, guys. If I'm in the room uh, videoing, I will... I will upload anything. I don't make any money from these shows, okay? Uh, every video that has m music clips, I make nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, YouTube takes all the money, and I don't mind. I mean, I'm not here to shake down vendors, shake down people. Uh, I'm doing this pro bono, actually at a money loss, to showcase the rooms raw and do my covers the way I wanted it to be seen when I was just nobody in the background, not having a channel. But there's a couple of... People, I cannot upload the video. They block it. And it's uh, Eagles are always ones that will block it. And people always like to play Eagles, Hotel California. I wish that would go away because I can't upload the videos. And then Take 5, Dave Brubeck, blocks the video. So there's other ones too. Bob Dylan's also very finicky. Metallica, some of these other ones. So be careful. If you want my video to be uploaded, uh, don't play those songs uh, as an FYI. But I went back. Because it was such a cool product that I think, look, this Planet DSP is not a replacement for Bach. Uh, it's only like 100 bucks, 300 bucks uh, for a mastering version. And it's not built to do crosstalk cancellation and stuff that the Bach is meant to do. It has nothing to do with once it, this music leaves the speaker, like the Bach will measure in-ear. And obviously, that's what you want to upgrade to if you can. But this might be a good way for people that are naysayers, people that don't like DSP. Maybe try this at 100 something bucks for the basic audio file version and load it on a Mac. It's a Mac plugin, I think, right now. And it allows you to remaster the recordings that maybe you say are bad. You always want to blame the recordings because your system doesn't sound good. Sometimes that is the case. A lot of times it's not. It's because you're getting poor frequency response and those recordings are just revealing 
your poor setup, your not the gear, usually stuff that you haven't corrected in your room. And that's why people play Keith Don't Go and Tin Pan Alley ad nauseum and only want to play those to show off the system because those kind of mask all the deficiencies you have at your listening position. This will now allow you to say, hey, I've got this song. I never can enjoy it on my uh, system. Well, now you'll be able to at least say, okay, if it is the recording, here's some things you can do to natively kind of remaster it with this software. And they give you some presets and some help to do it for you where you don't have to have the experience. You don't have to read books like this, have thousands of hours like I have doing it like I did manually in the past. You can actually do it and save it for different types of genres of music or even per song. Really cool little piece. And if you find that DSP helps here, then it's very easy to take that next leap and say, okay, the Bach is going to be light years. It's definitely worthwhile. If you can get with a $100 change, something that's meaningful, even on one song, because you can easily bypass it, turn it on or off. Even if you can find just one song where it helps you enjoy your music better, then that might push that needle where you're so anti-DSP. Say, hey, I'm agnostic to whatever works. If I'm getting more enjoyment, it doesn't matter if it's DSP, you know, XYZ tweak or whatever. That's all that matters, enjoying your music more. So props to Planet DSP, uh, Planet Venus uh, with their DSP plugin. Um, let's talk about some of my favorite rooms. Uh, these will be a little bit a duplicate, duplicative of what Doug and uh, Dave and Pete said because I really love the Accora room. <laughs> that was, uh, I think, Pete's favorite easily. I love the MBL room, which was another, which impressed Pete, who wasn't even an MBL fan. Uh, what was great about that is that Jeremy showed, he's usually in the bigger rooms, he had a smaller room, and guess what he did? He brought the smaller speakers to match. And in a lot of respects, I think he even told somebody this was one of the, I think he was most proud of this one. Uh, it, not that it had the most performance empirically. Obviously, that's a low frequency restricted speaker. But the level of quality he was able to get in that compromise room with that equipment was exceptional and blew a lot of people away. And they could sense the potential if they put that in a room or add subs or go up the line with full range models. So props to Jeremy on that. Uh, the other room uh, 3MA had as well was Longshay. Now that's another case where those Longshay speakers are big speakers. Work fine in that room, but you can go to 3MA and hear them in a bigger room. And I think you'll get an even a better flavor for the performance level of those. So these are the type of things you want to go in there like Neo in the Matrix and know what you're going to be focusing on. Sniffing the potential, how well he did with maximizing things. There's only so much you can gather just by sitting in the chair, listening, usually off axis, a song you don't even like, different volume, noise floor in the room. These are a lot of things that you can become more like Neo in the Matrix and navigate if you understand. And so that you may not have liked empirically what you heard in the launch day room from uh, upper ceiling of performance with those, but you could sense the potential for sure. And you go to 3MA here in Houston, they've got them in one of the bigger rooms. Definitely one to check out. Uh, Acora, again, puts in their big room and they had a small room. Blows people away every time. In fact, one of my uh, friends was trying to negotiate a deal on buying those VRC1s, both from an aesthetic standpoint, sound performance, everything combined. Uh, Val has started knocking it out the park with covering all the bases with this new finish. There's only four, I think, that he can make with this particular one, but he's going to inevitably come out with cool stuff uh, going forward. So that was blowing people away. We ended the show just how we started. He came and visited me last week at the rodeo and we went to the Laney Wilson concert at the rodeo, saw her live. And then I ended the show with him playing Laney Wilson, uh, on those chorus and that couldn't end the show better. She's great. Sounded phenomenal. People were blown away by their chorus and rightfully so. Now, what were some other ones that are kind of ones weren't mentioned? per se, that I was impressed by. Uh, I really like the Bella Sound Room with the analysis line source speakers. They're very similar to the Apogees of old, the uh, uh, Clarisys are now. Um, and I had seen the Bella Sound in Seattle. And probably that's a better video to go watch because I had time to talk to the designer in the Seattle show. So that video will give you more than I was able to get 
in this room. I mainly just was in there enough time to give you uh, music clips. Uh, but if you liked what you were hearing, I would go watch my video from Seattle on Bella Sound. That's really nice electronics. The aesthetic is right to my taste as well. Not excessive heat sinks, overbuilt, uh, built to purpose and design, unique, cool. And those analysis line source speakers were performing up there among the best. Um, but it brings up a good point. We did take a deviation one morning to Rhapsody Audio and heard the Alcivox as well as the Magico M9s. I can't release any videos of the Magico M9s. Uh, Magico doesn't want that uh, on YouTube, and understandably so. You can only gather so much from a YouTube video. So I respect them for that. I don't want to violate their request on that. But the Alcivox, man. In fact, I brought quite a few people over there. And of all the people in my posse, they were probably just as impressed with the Alcivox as they were with the M9s. Uh, they were phenomenal. And for a line source... In fact, my friend Doug, who owns MBL 101s, there's really nothing for him to do to go up or change other than going to the MBL Extremes. But I think he was seeing that the Alcivox could give him some... Uh, you know, off axis he might suffer, but on axis he was in line source versus the omnidirectional. He was starting to make some uh, calculations in his head of this is a speaker that's on par with the best out there, and certainly not just another Maggie copy. This is a whole level of steroids and amplification uh, in performance better than your typical Maggies. Um, also, I want to give a shout out. I'm going to talk about accessories in a minute. Magico M9s, look, that's out of the price tag of most people. Even billionaires won't spend that much money because you also have to spend probably several hundred thousand on the room to get that, that level of performance out of them. It's a, a great feat of engineering, and for those select few that can own them, great. But the reality is Magico's other speakers are going to be the more plentiful out there in the public and ones that people consider. But the things that I think people overlook with Magicos is they don't overlook the speakers, but they overlook their stands and they overlook their subs. The two things that I think would be more ubiquitous and even universal, uh, the Magico speakers can still be polarizing, either on looks or sound, whatever. Um, their stands, I think, are among the best. And you heard Chris at Rhapsody he compared them to other high-end stands. He liked the Magico stands the best. I saw it being constructed. If you watch my tour video, I focused a lot of time on those stands, and I was super impressed, covering all the bases, doing everything right. Magico stands were definitely a highlight of seeing those this weekend at Rhapsody. Uh, also, their sub, I want to have some uh, time with those in the near future. Um, but talking about accessories, again, I featured Norman with uh, uh, AV uh, Video Solutions. Uh, I always get his, he's got too long of a name. Anyway, Norman Varney, look him up. He's got EVPs, and I tell you what, those things, decoupling, the science, the, the testing he's done, he's the one that shot the video when he went to the uh, facility where they do testing, all kinds of acoustic testing in an old nuclear power plant. He does things by science and has shown where cup, decoupling is much better than cones and coupling. And again, I started my channel with this kind of stuff. These are accessories that you can measure the difference. You usually can hear, especially if it's under turntables or subwoofers. You can feel it, <laughs> how it changes, what hits your floor. You can hear it in different rooms of your house where subwoofer bleed through is less. So definitely watch that uh, video on EVPs with uh, Norman if you haven't seen it before. And of course, the other vendors. Nobody better uh, than... Kiermoose with vinyl stuff and uh, JR with Wally Tools. Although props to Dr. Vinyl was there too. I'm sure he, he, he would contend he knows how to set up turntable too. And I uh, hope he gets better. He was in a wheelchair. So they were all there. Those are the guys you want to see if you're a vinyl guy. Um, but what also stood out to me was the guys, um, Analog Artist uh, Guild. Again, sorry about the names. I'm doing most of this off the cuff. Uh, that does the Panzerholtz. Uh, shelving, uh, they're going to do shelves made of Panzerholtz and some decoupling, bearing type dampening feet that go on it. Those would be really killer for electronics or subwoofers as well. Uh, I think <laughs> I've been a big proponent of Panzerholtz, as you know. Only Kaiser and, to my knowledge, uh, Linkwitz top module offers some Panzerholtz. I'd love to see more speaker cabinet material made of Panzerholtz, but 
In the absence of that, for vibration control and just coolness factor, basically bulletproof plywood, uh, very impressive stuff. So I might be uh, getting some shelvings from those guys in the future to test it out and see how it does. Definitely not something I want to make sure I'm clear about. Vibration control for electronics, <clears throat> I put very low on, you know, once you've done everything else, if you're like me, even your chairs, I would put ahead of that, not having the back of your chair, which that's the only thing at Rhapsody. They have those Eames chairs or whatever. They have the thing. Those are thought of as the audiophile chairs, but they're really not when you measure it. So things like your chairs and other kind of vibration control under your speakers, subwoofers, and turntable are higher than any kind of vibration control under your electronics. But I'm at that point where I can play with that stuff because I take care of everything else. So I might do that in the future. And then, <clears throat> real quick, um, talking about, I mentioned earlier, the Infigo Electronics. And this is a story that Pete told me. He goes into a lot of rooms, and we did, I did one video where he plays this Eminem track. Now, it's not safe for work, the, you know, and it's not going to be, obviously, to some people's taste. But it has some infrasonic material that tests a speaker and a system to be able to reproduce it without bottoming out the woofers and whatnot. And you may knee-jerk just say, oh, well, that's not a good reference track because I'm never going to play that stuff anyway and I don't listen at that volume. Well, that's true. You, you're not going to use that as a sole metric of whether you buy a speaker or not. But <laughs> he owns those Techniques SRB1s that I put them on uh, and I, I had compared them to other speakers when they were at 3MA, much more expensive uh, speakers. And I noticed from the start that they could do full range and volume and dynamics that other much more expensive $60,000 speakers couldn't and were bottoming out on. And sure enough, he went into some rooms, some of them that made our list, played that track, and they were bottoming out on that track, the uh, m, m track. But the Stenheims with the Infigos handled it just fine. Now, to be fair, <clears throat> the Stenheim room did have two of the James Romaine Swarm subs in there, not so much to add amplitude to the bass, but to even out like you do when you have multiple subs. Sometimes you want to launch it from different to make it asymmetrical to the room and not have as many nodes, um, peaks and dips, basically. So that was in the Stenheim room. But the drivers itself were, were not bottoming out on that song. So the Infigo and Stenheim room, at least on that metric, and you think that that... There are lots of songs, especially if you play analog tape or LPs that are going to have infrasonic material. And there's lots of classical music that you're going to play at high dynamics, like you may play that rap song. So there is some translation of why you would want to use that as part of your suite of songs to test the speaker. If you're spending $60,000 on a speaker and it's bottoming out on this kind of track, you, need, you should know that ahead of time. Because you don't want to be embarrassed when you bring friends over. They want to play that track, crank it up, and then they're like, why did, I, why did you spend $60,000 on this? They can't even play this song that I want to hear. Okay, so put it in perspective, and this is just an FYI, and props to Stenheim and Infigo for passing uh, Pete's test, and I'll probably use it in the future as well. All right, guys, that's enough. Uh, I got I to gotta get packed and back out of town, so I'll have plenty more co to come. Great seeing you guys, and I hope to see you back here soon.